Today's show is sponsored by ThirdBridge. ThirdBridge is a widely used provider of expert interview transcripts whose clients include past guests on the show. Their content covers both public and private companies in any sector across all the major geographies around the world. To give you a sense, last year, over 16,000 investment professionals from 1,000 firms across private equity, public equity, and credit downloaded approximately 500,000 interview transcripts from Third Bridge Forum. Each of those transcripts covers a one-hour in-depth interview between an unbiased sector analyst and an industry executive. I've seen the platform and the coverage is incredible, ranging from mature mega caps to leading edge innovators like Stripe and SpaceX to thematic topics like crypto exchanges and alternative energy in China to just about everything in between. Third Bridge created this category of research and has by far the largest content platform available. If you're an asset manager or capital allocator looking to better understand your manager's positioning, visit thirdbridge.com slash capital for a try. Today's show is also brought to you by Anduin. Anduin is revolutionizing fund management with digitized fund subscriptions and marketing data rooms that streamline operations with real-time status updates. We all know traditional paper-based subscriptions are costly, tedious, and rife with errors. In fact, up to 80% of submitted documents are likely incorrect. Anduin's investor onboarding workflow improves the investor experience, bringing clarity, guidance, and efficiency to fund subscriptions, drastically reducing error rates. For more information or to arrange a demo, visit fundsub.io slash capital allocators. Hello. I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can join our mailing list and access premium content at CapitalAllocators.com. Mark Andreessen from A16Z famously proclaimed a decade ago that software is eating the world. His prophecy has proved prescient. Cloud computing enabled the rapid, cost-effective deployment of software, startups flourished, and venture capital returns have been phenomenal. Venture capital is a fascinating investment area whose many days in the sun shine brightest this year. Institutional portfolios with large venture allocations soared to their best year in history. And yet, parts of venture are unique in being both efficient and unactionable. Many believe that Sequoia or Benchmark will produce returns at the top of the pack, but there's not much action anyone can take to participate. This miniseries explores the industry, focusing on some favorites of institutional investors who are still investable to those in the loop. Each has a great differentiated story to share and something to prove. That said, this field moves quickly, so as the disclaimer goes, past accessibility is not a guarantee of future capacity. My guest in the 12th episode of Venture is Eating the Investment World is Kathy Hsu, the founding partner of Capital Today, a $2.5 billion firm that's one of the top venture capitalists in China. Capital Today strives to help small and mid-sized companies become the leading brands in China. Over the years, some of our winners include JD.com, Meituan, VIP Shop, and C-Trip. Our conversation covers Kathy's upbringing in China, early professional career in venture, and start as an entrepreneur. We discuss her vision for Capital Today, the three ways they help entrepreneurs, sourcing ideas, working with companies, attractive investments, benefits of the firm's evergreen fund structure, impact of the government action on companies, and desirable characteristics in founders and industry. Lastly, we touch on competition in the venture landscape in China. Ventures Eating the Investment World is brought to you by Omni. Omni helps private capital investors track and analyze individual deals while providing comprehensive financial and legal insights across their portfolio. It houses the largest database of investment transactions in the private markets extracted directly from executed agreements, 
including the legal terms, co-investor details, liquidity preferences, valuations, and round sizes. With that information, investors can make faster investment decisions, benchmark deal terms, understand market trends, and enhance portfolio analytics. Omni's clients include leading venture funds, corporate venture groups, family offices, and endowments, including a number of past guests on the show. You can learn more at omni.fund, that's A-U-M-N-I dot fund. Please enjoy my conversation with Kathy Shu in this, the 12th episode of Venture is Eating the Investment World. Kathy, thanks so much for doing this. Well, it's a great pleasure. Thank you, Ted. I would love to have you take me all the way back to what it was like growing up in China. I was born and raised in Sichuan province. There's a little town called the Bigfoot. That's like a factory, the state-owned factory manufacture heavy-duty trucks. I was born there. And uh, we kind of live in the city, like a very uh, remote area, in the mountain area. That's like uh, your defensive reason. Then my father was working there, and then he was actually promoted to be the general manager of that factory. That factory is called Sichuan Automobile Plant. And that's a factory with about 3,000 workers, with the families, about 10,000 people. And as a general manager in a state-owned enterprise, you're kind of like a big family head. Like everybody comes to my home and talk about their problems. Some people come here and say, oh, this is a quality problem of the manufacturing. Most people come talk about their personal desire. <laughs> like, oh, I need to have a bigger flat because my kids, like, I have three kids now. And some people say, I, why should I have a bigger salary raise? Because I work hard than my colleagues. And there's a lot of like people come to my dad and ask him this and that. When I was a little girl, I, I really enjoyed this moment because I will be responsible for pulling a cup of tea for them. And then I will sit down and listen. And then they will come here. And after they're gone, I have lots of questions to ask my dad. And then my mom and my brother were, were sort of gone to sleep. And I, my question is still not finished. And I think when I was a little girl, I kind of received my MBA from my dad in the real life. <laughs> a lot of uh, it's about human nature. I asked a lot of questions about human nature. And I think that is a, a very interesting period of time. And um, my dad had a lot of influence on me as well. So as you went through your schooling, how did that take you on the path of your career? When I was a little girl, I was a very naughty girl. <laughs> I didn't work very hard. I was like playing chutes during school time. And I was like, a, there's like a 50 students in one class. And I was like very much in the middle. And I remember one day and this teacher, Mrs. Gao, she come to my home. She reported on me. She said, oh, your daughter always talk during class, talk to this and talk to that and eat snack food during class. And most importantly, she escaped like a chemistry class the whole afternoon and play, uh, go to the river to get some fish. And my dad was so angry and he asked me not to play with other kids, naughty kids. So I kind of was isolated and studied at home. And initially, when I studied at home, I was like one textbook on the top and a novel at the bottom. When I heard the footstep on my dad, I would switch the book. <laughs> <laughs> so I played that kind of game for a little while. But then suddenly, one thing sort of inspired me. I remember very clearly, I didn't know I was a good student. And the one thing really changed me. That was a little encouragement because then my dad find this coach, a uh, sort of tutor, private tutor. And then the teacher gave me a lot of encouragement. And that thing changed my life. And suddenly I found, wow, study was so fun. And I learned so much from chemistry. And then we got this private tutor in physics. And then I become suddenly a very good student. And at graduation of junior high school, we basically have three choices in life. First is that you can go to the vocational school. And after that, you will become a factory worker or you can go to a, another vocational school outside, but and also kind of like a factory worker, blue, blue color. But if you want to go to university, you have to pass the entrance exam to this or called major senior high school. And most of my classmates choose to become the vocational school because if you become a student there, you can get paid 16.5 yuan per month and you get a job guaranteed. All my friends choose that. Because that's where the dad and mom become. But I kind of said, oh, I want to go to university. My mom said, why don't you want to register for the vocational school? You get paid and you got a current job. I said, no, 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 I just want to try. 
So ever since then, I studied very, very hard. And luckily, I got passed to that entrance exam. That is a life-changing thing. In hindsight, I think it is really very unfair for the young kids. Like at that time, we were just a junior high school graduate. We don't know the world. It very much depends on whether you have good parents to tell you this important decision or whether you have that realization. But I just feel like that education system is like they already decide your life to be a blue color or white color at the age of 13 or 14. And that's lifetime decision you made. I was very, very lucky. At that time, I got my dad, who's kind of encouraged me to go to the major high school that I become you know, eligible for university. And look at my, I have like a three other girls, like very similar background with me. And their life is very, very different. But I think they are as smart as I am. If they were given the chance to study in the major high school, they will be like me. University, a much different future. So as you came out of school, how did you get started in the business world? After graduation uh, from Nanjing University, and I actually joined the Bank of China headquarter, I was actually just a banking clerk doing bill collection, like a very simple thing. But I kind of did it very well. And then I, during my spare time, I, I was teaching my coworkers in English because it's the Bank of China that deal with a lot of foreign customers. I teach them English, but I just feel like, oh, I was not making a lot of progress. After three years, I did all the things I could do as a banking clerk. And I become the leader in the youth league. I got all the rewards I could have, but I was not making a lot of progress. I just said to myself, I need to change my life. I don't know what is a change. I wanted to go to study abroad, but my parents didn't have enough money. But you know, the lucky thing happened is that one day the general manager of Bank of China came to me, Kathy, there's a great opportunity. We would like to nominate you to try. This is a joint training program between the British government and Chinese government. We're going to train the CPA, UK CPA. It's called ACCA, but you need to sit in the exam. That exam is in English. I thought, wow, really? Because among all the nominated candidates, I was the only one who studied English. So I memorized the whole book. I memorized the whole book. And then through that entrance exam, I did pretty well. And that's another life change event. I was selected by Pricewaterhouse to go to Hong Kong. And uh, I kind of supposed to, to work there for three years in 1992. It was very early days. And everybody speak Cantonese. I'm the only one speak Mandarin. I don't even understand Cantonese. So nobody wants to book me. As a junior staff, we normally live in this big room that you was like booked by the senior manager or partner to work on the audit project. And there's like two person from mainland China, me and my coworker, Peter. We are the only two sitting in the room. Nobody book on us. And at that time, we feel kind of embarrassed, <laughs> hugely embarrassed. And later on, one thing really changed. It's like, oh, we have like edge share listing. All these Chinese mainline companies are getting listed overseas. And then we got a lot of work, all the people sent to mainland China, staying in the factory for two, three months to do the audit. And most of those people, they do not speak Mandarin very properly, but I'm like very fluent. So I become the coordinator. I started to shine. So that's the working experience in Pricewaterhouse. I would like to say that I worked for Pricewaterhouse for three years. And during that period of time, I learned what is professional. Professional means that if you haven't finished your job, you cannot go to sleep. We work very, very late. And secondly, when the boss is waiting for you, you cannot walk to him. You have to run to him. So it's really trained me to be much more hardworking, very professional. And that was a very, very good experience. I'm really grateful. I'm really grateful to my boss and my colleagues at Pricewaterhouse. You become, I kind of I were trained by Pricewaterhouse to become a professional. That's kind of the first touch on the auditing. But at the end of three years, I feel like I didn't like the product of auditing. I talked to a partner in Pricewaterhouse. I said, I want to stay in Hong Kong. Oh, you guys, you have to go back to Bank of China. They send you here to learn, and then you, you need to come. I said, oh, well, I feel like the accounting, uh, I think that this business world has no boundary of whether it's mainland China or Hong Kong. I remember very clearly we had this conversation. The partner is, I'm a very great friend to him. He actually coached me a lot, but he feel like I need to go back, and I said, I want to stay. 
And uh, I kind of stayed and joined Peregrine, an investment bank. There, from Peregrine, I started to learn investment. I started to invest at Peregrine. And my first investment in a company called Wahaha. This is a beverage company. I learned so much from the founder. It's very interesting. That was 1995, very early stage of venture capital investment in China. I was very lucky. It was like a first batch of venture capitalists, but I was a very junior guy. I could not claim any credit of that investment. I just learned so much from this founder, Mr. Zhong. So he actually created a category called clean water, Shui. Mr. Zhong, he went to Paris. Think about the era. It's very, very hard for you to imagine as American, right? You live in a very wealthy society. 1995 in China, nobody drank bottled water. We didn't even know what was bottled water. We never saw it. When I was a university student, I didn't even dare to open a Coca-Cola. I thought that was going to explode. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't seen the real world. About so, so Mr. Zhong, back in 1995, he went to Paris. He said, wow, the French people are very yang qi, just like they have Western style, very stylish. They drink bottled water. But in China, we didn't even see what was bottled water. So he said, wow, the bottled water is going to fly. So Mr. Zhong come back. He said he's going to invest in bottled water. The production, he made one bold decision. He said he wants to raise like a 45 million US dollar and bought three production line. Each production line is over 10 million. So he wants to build three production line at the same time. I remember I was working for Peregrine. Peregrine did the due diligence together with this yoga company called Danon, the group of Danon, the French guy, the yoga guy. So the yoga guy said, oh, we well, didn't even know the, the category is the market is there or not. You should invest in one production line. And then if it's proven, you do the other two. The Mr. So, no, 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 no. He said, I feel the market is there. I feel the market is going to boom. We just need to do three production at one go. He said, in China, no matter what you do, if you do well, there will be like hundreds and thousands of copycats. So he said, I'm going to do three production line. He said, the entry barrier, the only way to defend your competitor is get big fast. I remember very clearly he had that argument with a French guy. Talk me through, as you went through your career at Peregrine, how did you evolve to launching an early venture capital fund? I worked for Peregrine for three years. I was very lucky. I kind of see how Mr. Zong built a number one brand with Wahaha. So after Peregrine went bankrupt, I joined Baring. I, at Baring, I worked there for seven years. And during that seven year, I invested a number of companies who become the richest man in China. <laughs> so I kind of feel like I wanted to start my own business after working in the industry 10 years, three years at Peregrine, seven years at Bering. I kind of want to start my own business. So at that time, I have already built a decent track record. I have invested three guys who become the richest man in China. We're early investor, like one of very kind of uh, Mind-changing investment is a company called NetEase. NetEase is a company I kind of made all the mistake I could have made in one company, but luckily we still made some money. <laughs> After NetEase, I become very strong person internally, very strong. I went through the all kind of cycle. This is a company where the first investor, when I uh, called NetEase founder, it was a small company with a dozen employee all in a code of uh, a dormitory. When I called, called William Dean, the founder, he told me, he said, Cassie, I own 100% of the company. I said, I don't want to manage people. I want to be a happy CTO. Could you please hire a CEO for me? I said, well, he was like 28 years old. I was like 30 years old. Oh, yeah, I'm going to hire a CEO for him. So I hired a CEO for him. That was a big mistake. So, <laughs> so he couldn't get along with the CEO. They had a big fight. And the CEO had to bring a bodyguard to work. <laughs> so there's a lot of cultural difference. So the first mistake I made is hire a CEO above the founder. And the lesson learned is that the CEO has a lot of pros and cons. And uh, if you want to help him, hire a CEO under him, not a CEO above him. That's a lesson I learned, the first mistake. The second mistake we made is that the company went IPO during Internet Bubble Day 2000. 
And when the company was actually not ready, and then you know we're the first investor. Our share price is five dollar per share, and then after IPO, it went up all the way to thirty dollar. And then the bubble burst. The company went through a lot of plain class action lawsuit, SEC investigation. They become a junk stock, and during the most difficult time, everybody vote to sell the company, and seven board member. Five vote for sell, only two vote for not sell. That's the founder and me. And you know the selling price. The selling price is eighty million U.S. dollar, and they have like seventy million net cash in the bank. <laughs> so it was how desperate people is. But I think the reason I voted no sell is because. It's not because I can forecast it's worth so much money. That is now the market cap is much bigger. It's like we are in hell. The good news about being in hell is that you could not get any worse. The future is on track to heaven. So I called every director because everybody is twenty years old, very young. I'm the oldest director, thirty one years old. I called every other director and said, "You have fiduciary duty. You cannot sell this company cheap. The company has like seventy million U.S. dollar cash. They can do a lot of things." And William Dean, he's a visionary, but he has killer instinct. He will find some way. So after you have this great success with NetEase, what was it like? Thinking, oh, you're going to go start your own venture capital fund back in 2005. Initially, I think the LP sparkled the idea on me. I think I went to some kind of conference, and after the conference, one of the LP sitting in the audience, he said, "You're very good. If you want to start the company, start your own fund. I will be your investor." So he actually approached me. I got like an LP said, "If you want to start own a firm, let me know. We'll fund you. Something like that." And what was the venture capital market like in China at the time? At that time, it's still quite early because, like I said, 1995 was like a really the first batch of venture capital that was emerged. I was lucky enough to be one of those. Most of fund are like a Asia fund, pan Asia fund, and global fund, and they have started to have their Asia team mainly in Hong Kong, not even in China. Most of them, and they have the. IC committee sitting in New York or Silicon Valley or London. Most of the firm are like that. Very big name, China fund. You don't even have a China fund. So I'm kind of the first few company who started the China fund. I think I made a very important decision when I started Capital Today. I wanted to be hundred percent independent. I found every GP. Who got a sponsor after one or two tranches? They go independent. I think why don't I just go independent at the first go? It means that maybe it takes longer to do fundraising. Maybe the fund size is smaller, but this is the fund that I can have complete discretion to decide its strategy and future. Because by that time, I have already ten years experience. I kind of knew what works. I learned so much from Wahaha, the founder. I learned something called about power of. Branding, and I also knew something called as power of compounding because we made a lot of money by long-term hold. So when I started Capital Today, we had this meeting in the East Mountain where I lay out the blueprint of our fund. We had a vision, build a business for China, and we had the belief to believe power of branding and the power of compounding. We did have three days meeting. We had a lot of debate. One of my partners said, "Oh, Kathy, we're in the business of investment. Our vision should be maximize return for investors." I said. No, 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 no. Because at that time, I'm already financially independent. I just want to do something more than money. I kind of want to help the entrepreneur build the number one brand. So, build business for China. That this very simple word, but it decides a lot of our behavior. Build normally takes like five to ten years to build a business. Uh, that's one thing. So we need to hold it long. Number two, since it's built, it's not uh, just. Investor, you need to help them. So we have our capital today. Three weapon. We will help them with three things that we feel the entrepreneur need most, and we are very good, which is help them build the core team, build the KPI and culture, and build the brand. We've been practicing that all these years, and it works very nicely. So we have three weapon, very hands on. We are very long term, and because of this, we don't do a lot of deal. We have kind of focus and discipline. We have this slogan. From the very beginning, called "Kill the mediocre deal quickly." Do not settle with entrepreneur that has seventy score. That's our slogan. So, I'd love to hear a little bit about what is the environment like for finding opportunities in China. 
Oh, that's a very good question. Time change. The dynamic is a little bit different. When we first started Capital Today, we had this cold call strategy. A lot of deal, like forty、uh, percent of a deal, are sourced by cold call because at that time there's a lot of deal flow. And when we cold call the entrepreneur, they didn't even know what was venture capitalist. So we've been able to source it by cold call. We use this top-down strategy, decide what we like, and then we cold call top twenty target, and then we compare the founder, compare the track record. So initially, it's a lot of cold call, and of course, we have network. And nowadays, there's a lot of money, and of course, I think the entrepreneur also become a lot better in terms of quality. Because we have a lot of returnee, those well-educated, very smart people, they come back with creative idea, with technology, and I think the quality of founder are getting much better. The availability of the founder also a lot more, but also is a lot more money. So you got more capital and more entrepreneur. It's like almost every company fundraising they have a small financial advisor. So it's very important for us to build a brand. So these days we have a good brand. So if the FA will find us, entrepreneur will find us. We still do cold call if we want to find a company. We still do cold. Call. So so we have a kind of strategy is like top down. We have investment team, and then we use top down. We approach the entrepreneur, and sometimes the FA will come to us. So the very important thing is that you build a reputation, build a brand. I think capitalist reputation is good in a sense. Number one, as an entrepreneur, love us because. We have this 28-year evergreen fund. We are very long-term capital. That's number one. Number two, we have the three weapon value add capability. We have a value add team. It's like six people doing nothing, just doing value add. These people are very experienced people. They are brand specialists. They are new retail specialists. They are data analysis specialists. They have counter marketing specialists. They have recruiting specialists. We found for the early stage company, like when they are like just started, they need a lot of hand holding. So how do we build our value add team? It's like we study the best practice in China. So how many people do you have on your team? Thirty ish people. They book all the, the. We have hunters. We have farmers. We have research analysts. Each doing different things. I think it's very effective because these days the market is more competitive. So you don't have like three months to do due diligence. You have like three weeks. So during that three weeks, we want to see everything. So we have winner patenting to study the winner patent. We have like consumer、uh, specialists to do customer interview. Call thirty of them. Focus group study. And we have like a data analysis team to do operation and financial due diligence. What types of companies do you think work for venture investing in China? I think in China we still have a lot of category opportunity. I.e., you have like really disruptive companies. If you look at the history, who really made money in the venture capital industry in China? It's basically internet, like online game, e-commerce, and then we have mobile internet. And you have all this kind of app like short video, so it's really around technology innovation. We call this is a chance like ten times better. Like e-commerce is ten times better than offline retailer. Why? Because you have selection, unlimited selection. Like Basil said in his 1997 annual letters, retail is all about number one selection, number two cheaper price, number three fast delivery. So ten times better we call technology innovation. China, our portfolio may not be the first one who innovated. The、so、U.S. guy, like Amazon, they are the innovator of e-commerce. But in China, like JD's founder Richard, he's doing e-commerce, but he's one step ahead than Amazon because when JD started the business, when we give him the money, he did two things. Number one, he expanded the category. Number two, he built the distribution center. Amazon didn't have distribution center because you guys have like UPS and FedEx. But in China, we didn't have UPS and FedEx back then, so there's a lot of small guys doing delivery, and the service sucks. Like eighty percent of customer complaint come from one thing and one thing only. So they didn't treat our parcel nicely. They're very late. So Richard decided to build the distribution center himself. So I also call that innovation. JD is doing so well. We made a lot of money because it is the first mover in e-commerce direct model. He built the warehouse, built the distribution center. He promised double eleven. If you order before eleven noon time, you get it on the same day. If you order before eleven p.m., you get it on the next day. The consumer loves us because of fast delivery. So 
You mentioned that you have this evergreen 28-year life fund. How did you come to decide to raise capital in that way instead of a more traditional venture capital approach that has a shorter horizon? So for venture capital, I have a couple of the number one is that there are not many great companies in this world. So the key is to hit the home run. Home run is that you're investing in those great companies that's going to change the world. And the home run, there are two things. One is frequency of the home run, i.e. each fund, how many home run can you have? That's frequency of the home run. The second essence is that the intensity of the home run. Each home run, how much money can you make? And I would say frequency of the home run, it depends on luck, whether you have catch this wave of technology. So far, we've been very lucky. We got a wave of internet. Uh, we got a mobile internet. Now we got AI. Maybe we'll have metaverse. So that's luck. But I think intensity of a home run is more important because you can decide. The intensity of home run is really affected by two things. Number one, how much equity you own this company or how much amount of money you put in, either very big amount or very big equity, and then number of years of holding. So these are the two elements, big equity, long-term hold. So I think the biggest mistake, if you ask me, is that we're not able to hold on to the winner because the fund has limited life. And the once and all solve this problem is just have this evergreen structure that enable us to hold on to a winner for a long, long time and really enjoy the power of compounding. Now I have lived the evergreen fund of Capital Today, two tranches. I really feel the power. One thing about power company, when I talk about it, you don't have a feel. But I, when I show you this curve, you will see the power company has a very deep curve at the, at the end. So when the size gets bigger, every year it's compound. It's much more impactful. I just tell you two data. For example, we invest in a company called a pharmacy chain, iPhone pharmacy chain. This is a very traditional business where the first investor, we invest in the company back to 2007 when they have like 70 store. We hold this company for 10 years. We invested 30 million. It become 400 million. So 10 year, 11 times return, not bad. But guess what? I didn't want to sell this company, but the fund one is expiring. So what I did is something very important. We set up a separate fund just to hold e-phone. I feel, oh, this is Walgreens of China. Even this company's IP is worth like $4 billion US dollar. Look at Walgreens. Look at CVS, like $60 billion. If you're like me, believe this is Walgreens of China, you believe in power compounding, you roll over to the new fund, continue to hold it. If you want cash, we'll give you cash. So I give my LP two options, roll over or cash out. 70% people choose cash out and 30% choose roll over. And us has GP, we roll over all our carry, which is worth 80 million US dollar into the new fund and hold it another 10 years. I'm going to tell you how important this is. So it took me 10 years to create the value from 30 million to 400 million, 10 years. Same company in the past three years, we made the decision roll over like three years ago. And in that three years, we made 600 million return. So 10 years, 300 million return. Three years, 600 million, same company. What is that? This is really power of compounding. Another example is that we got the tranche one investor and tranche two investor and end up the tranche two investor has better return. Hey, why is that? They come in at the NAV, why they have better return? It's because the same portfolio of tranche one portfolio, they made a lot more return in T2 period. T1 period, they made a return of 600 million. Same portfolio, they made 2.3 billion in T2 period. That's exactly the power of compounding. I'm very lucky we got this evergreen structure that enable us to hold on to a winner. You don't need every company like that. Top five, enough. Top five winner. The power of company will make you a lot of money. What happens when you decide to hold one that you think will be a winner, but things change? First of all, we look at the traits of our big winners. They all have something in common. Number one is that the TAM, they have a very big TAM, total addressable market. If you look at our big home run, one is JD, it's an e-commerce, right? And the second is Meituan. It's also service e-commerce, and then e-phone pharmacy chain, and then we have Boss Direct recruiting, and then we have the VIP shop. So this company all have one thing in common is that they have a very large addressable market. And secondly, the product and solution, they're really much better, 10 times better. And thirdly, the kind of is 
the must have. It's not like a, it's oh, it's like it's a must have or maybe have. I think it has to be a must have. And typically, we look at a few key data. Number one, customer cohort. This is more important. One thing about e-commerce, it's very good, but you need to spend a lot of money acquiring the customer. You cannot rely on acquiring customer, new customer, because the media is going to be a monopoly. Media is monopoly, and they use the bidding system. So acquisition cost of new customer is getting higher and higher and higher. So you need to rely on old customer repeat order. You have to check frequency. Basically, you have to check cohort. Cohort is a very important thing. So, do they repeat the customer? One thing we check at JD every time. I give JD five times bridge loan when nobody give JD the money because when we start fundraising, two thousand eight financial crisis come. Richard met thirty investor. Nobody give him the money. He was so worried that his hair turned white. <laughs> People thought he died it because of stuff. No, he was just so scared. And during that time, we gave him five times bridge loan. Of course, we like Rachel. We like the founder. And another important thing, we look at the one important data. That data is we we'll look at the same customer, different vintage year. Are they increasing their purchase every single year? Two thousand nine year, two thousand year vintage year customer. Oh, they're buying more and more every single year. So existing customers, growing number of order is the key. For the business formula, that's very important thing. Have you run into situations where the success of some of your companies have created risk in the government eyes in terms of continuing to capture economic returns? You can see the anti-monopoly rule. I think there are always two sides of the coin. For example, the government said you cannot. This is an anti-monopoly. That means you cannot force the supplier to choose one among the two. This is not good news for Alibaba. It's very good news for JD. I'm the first investor of JD. I witnessed the JD the whole growth episode. One of the big pain is that when this policy was not executed, Alibaba has this policy: take side, choose one among the two. So when JD had this big promotion day on its birthday, June the eighth, JD couldn't source a supplier from these merchants because Baba will call them. If you dare to. List on JD, I will delist you on Baba. You know Baba's market share has always been seventy percent. JD is like twenty percent, so JD cannot grow its category like、uh, fashion because Baba has such a domineering position, and they have this take one among the side with one among the two. So this been years, and then JD reported to the government. The government said, "Oh, okay. If you have complaint, show me the evidence. You need a merchant to testify for you," and no one dared to testify. No one. Was like it's a fact. Everybody knew it, but no one dared to testify. So this is really unequal competition. But after the government imposes no no monopoly, ever since it was implemented, JD has been going very nicely. JD's fashions are going well. So it's bad for Baba. It's good for JD, right? It's always two sides of a coin. I think pretty it's good for a lot of small companies for entrepreneurship. It's better to have a competitor so your team has respect for the customer. They have to keep on innovating to come up with good solution, good product because the competitor chasing you behind you. Then also good for the government. It's good to have the、like、two person. So I think it's good,、uh, and also for like a community e-commerce. We invested in Xinsheng. Mister Yue is the first innovator of this business model. This is a wonderful model. When I first met him, he was having a monthly revenue of fifty million RMB. I say, wow, he's growing ten times. When you see something growing ten times, still profitable, that means the market's huge, huge, huge. So I talked to him. I met him at three p.m. and we talked until three a.m. Twelve hours. We signed the binding term sheet right on spot. And I give Mister Yue two advice. Oh, this is very, very important thing. So get big fast. Number one advice. Number two advice. Keep low profile. Don't tell other people. This is your secret weapon. This is a business model. You find the gold mine. Don't tell. So we keep low profile for two and a half years. During that period of time, I have invested five more times. My initial investment is seven million. It ended up like hundred sixty five million. We double down, triple down, total five times. But bad news happens. Like one years ago, they start fundraising, very high profile fundraising. Our business plan was seen by all these giants like Meituan, Pinduoduo, and JD, and they decided to come in. 
Our model is very, very important. It's disruptive to traditional e-commerce. This is a new e-commerce. It's like you order tonight before 11 a.m. Tomorrow you go pick it up at 11 p.m. at the mom pop store. So it's a pre-order, very effective in terms of efficiency, logistic costs. It's a very good model. That's why it's growing so fast. And then they have like Pinduoduo and Meituan fighting like crazy. And the government said, no, uh, you cannot do negative gross profit margin because if you do negative gross profit and all the offline retailer like Walmart, RT Mart, Carrefour, they're going down, down, down. They're going to just go bankrupt. So there are a lot of complaints from these offline guys. So the government said, no, the three rule, basically no negative gross profit margin. You cannot force the supplier to take one among the two. You cannot do arbitrage on the customer use the big data, like charge a different price for the same product, different customers. So these are the three rules. I think when I called Mr. Yue, because when they had a big competition from Meituan and Pinduoduo, Mr. Yue said, he said, oh, thank government. Now we can survive because all the other guys died. Now Mr. Yue still can survive because you cannot do negative margin. So if, if you do negative margin, what happens is the, the big guy have all the cash. They will win, right? So it's good for select. They can survive. And I think it's good for Meituan and Pinduoduo as well. And I was always asking them the question, you burn so much money for what? JD burns so much money, but they build a warehouse, right? You burn so much money used for subsidy to the customer. Do you think the customer are going to be royal to you? Of course not. They will choose whoever is the cheaper, better. So at the end of the day, it's a competition of supply chain, competition of logistics. Why don't you use all that money burning on subsidy and use that money to build the warehouse, cold chain warehouse, build the supply chain? And that's a long-term sustainable. That means maybe our growth rate is not like 100% year on year, but it's going to be like a 50% year, year on year, but it's going to sustain for a very long period of time. I think it's good for everybody. I think the government is pretty smart. All this decision, <laughs> pretty smart, pretty long term, actually. I'm curious to turn the lens of competition from companies to you and your competitors. So some of the big U.S. venture capital firms have started China initiatives in the last decade. And I'm curious how you see competition for attractive deals. First of all, I think venture capital is a very local business because you have to fill the market. The con, not only you meet the, uh, the entrepreneur, then the, the consumer, the competitor, it has to be a local decision. Whoever has a global decision, you know, I see city in New York, London, they're going to fail, period. They're not going to be as competitive. Second thing is that the team has to be local. I think the good team will spin off already because <laughs> you're a very great investor. Why do you want to report to a boss, like take half of the carry and then doesn't really contribute a lot? And then decision is very long and not very to this point. So I think local team wins for sure. So the question is, how do we compete with Sequoia? Like they have a very global brand, but they have a local team. The team is pretty good. We come across Sequoia quite often in deal sourcing. And I was saying so far, we have win maybe three times out of five times. Not because I'm better than Niu Xian. It's because I'm very hands-on. We don't do a lot of deals. We do like each year maybe five to 10 deals each year, each fund, maybe 20, 30 deals. So we are very selective and I can be very hands-on each deal. In pitching the deal to entrepreneur, I'm the one who's pitching. But in Sequoia, maybe Neil doesn't have time. He has so many, so much sort of deals working on. When you are looking at a company to potentially invest in, what's more important to you, the entrepreneur, the person, or the company, the industry? Mm, I think they're both very important. If you ask me, if you force me to choose one among which was more important, I would just say the business is more important than the founders. I have seen a lot of very smart founders struggling in a mediocre business. They will never get it. But if you have a very great business and the founder saw that business, their first mover, they will win. I think about founder, you know, the question is about what kind of founders are we looking for? I think we don't, particularly for early stage deal, you can have like a 100 reason don't invest, but you just need one reason to invest. If the founder have killer instinct, he can see what others cannot see. And that's enough. He may have a lot of shortcomings, like, oh, he's not a very good people manager. He has a very short temper. It doesn't matter. What matters is that whether he has killer instinct, he can see what others cannot. And that's the most important quality I'm looking for. For example, Mr. Zhong Wahaha, he went to Paris, he saw bottled water, and he immediately feel, oh, this is it. He will bring this to China. 
So he found that category. That's his killer instinct. He is a category creator. He's the first one who saw it. William Ding of NetEase. He is the first one who saw the opportunity of online gaming. He is the first one who did. He spent three years come up with the first product in the most difficult time when the share price is below one dollar, class action lawsuit, all this kind of difficulty. He come up with this cool product. He is the first one who did it. So he become the richest man in China. We made so much money. So I think founders' capability to see what others cannot. So we call it killer instinct. What areas are you most excited about going forward? If you ask me to use one key word, I would say AI. I think AI is changing a lot of industry. When I see AI, don't think about the technology. So it's a kind of application in every single industry. For example, we like outbound e-commerce. I think that's a just purely AI-driven business, and、uh, we like electronic car and autonomous driving. That's an AI-driven business. We like new brand, new retail. That's AI because AI is a new tool. For example,、uh, we have a company called Halara. They are doing online Lula Lemon. We have a company called Pet Pet. They are doing baby clothes. So what I mean is that why they have to do with AI? Because if you look at the fashion business, you work very hard. At the end of the year, all your profit is in the inventory because you don't know what the customer need. You have to guess, forecast what customer need. You don't know what is the best price, the right price. Secondly, they use A/B test to find the right price. Zara, how does Zara come up with a new price? How do you know what is the right price for a new SKU? You have so many SKU every day. Zara uses test like every new piece come up, they they give five different price tag, and then they sell at five different store. After a while, they find whoever sell the best is the final price. And our engineer use A/B test; they always find the best price. And then they use algorithm counter marketing the algorithm to find the acquisition channels. So all this is algorithm driven. I think they are going to change the supply chain with algorithm as well. What's different about investing in China venture capital than, say, the United States? I have a lot of respect for the venture capitalists in the states because. They really investing in the disruptive technology, so these are the game changer. They're the one who change the world. So there's a lot of zero to one type of technology innovation disruption, and I think most of them in the USA, <laughs> and that's something we envy. But in China, we have more like oh, we learn from the US, but we kind of have this improvement. Like oh, we learn e-commerce, but we have. JD learned from Amazon. I think the mobile internet thing. I think China is more advanced in terms of payment, in terms of short video. Like、uh, I think TikTok is take over the world. TikTok has 800 million DAU, going very fast. Mostly we have like one、uh, to ten. We learn from the US, but we kind of China market is big enough. We have scale. We have network effect. We have brand power. We can go international. So we have there one to ten. But I think in the future, I feel like we may have more zero to one thing. Right now, we got more very smart people, like the top student. Everybody go to the U.S. to study. Now they're coming back. I see that trend very obviously. And I also believe that we have a lot of cheap labor. We have like two hundred three hundred million farmers migrating to the city. They become the delivery boy. They become the massage. They become the waiter, waitress, the janitor, etc. So we still have that labor advantage. This is not just cheap labor. We also have skilled worker, the worker who know how to use robotics. So I think this advantage of cheap labor we still have. And don't forget, these farmer worker migrate to the city. They become consumers. China already have like two hundred, three hundred million middle class consumers, and these people's salary are increasing double digit every single year. So we will have maybe six hundred million. Middle class consumer in the next five to ten years. So we will have this era that we have advantage of manufacturing cheap labor, but advantage of a huge middle class consumer. And we believe that when China become the largest country for both manufacturing and consumption, and China's leader will become a global leader. And we see that happening in the world of electronics manufacturing. In the world of cell phone, and it will happen in the world of electronic vehicles. So we will still have some good years ahead of us. I think next ten, twenty years, because of this post-Louis sort of era that we get into 
this episode, which is very good for the country. If you look out at capital today for capital tomorrow, a couple of years out, five, ten years out, what do you think ultimately drives your success? We have very long term capital. And we are very focused and disciplined. We have only one drive, which is invest in great company and build the number one brand for China. Great. Well, Kathy, I want to make sure I get a chance to turn to a few closing questions before we finish off. So, what is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? <laughs> okay, we have this walking sister group every Saturday. We walk around like two hours, and now we have lunch together. And that's a lot of fun for me. It's like a four to five of us every week. We take a very long walk. We exchange ideas, compare notes, and complain. All this sort of negative energy you can lead out. So it's like when you share the happiness, the happiness double. When you share the pressure, the pressure is halved. That's a very good way. <laughs> <laughs> What's your biggest personal pet peeve? Hmm. I think for a person, I think trustworthy is most important. So I don't like people cheat. How about on the investment side? Your biggest investment pet peeve? I always tell the entrepreneurs: if you don't have a great idea, don't start a business. This world do not need another mediocre product and, and another mediocre service. You're wasting time of yourself, your colleagues, and you waste money for the shareholders. So don't start unless you have great ideas. Which two people have had the biggest impact on your professional life? Warren Buffett. <laughs> I'm a very big believer of Warren Buffett. He's my hero. So I read his annual letter like a priest reading the Bible. When I get very, very old, I want to like him tap dance to work. And then he spent like five hours reading and two hours talking to the entrepreneurs he like. And how about a second person who's had an impact on your professional life? I would say my dad. He's a competitive guy. He always wants to be number one. And I think he passed that gene to me. And secondly, I think he is a first principle person. He always think with first principle. My dad has very good killer instinct. I learned a lot from him. So a lot of decisions, the first principle. Even at the age of 86, he has debated with my brother. And he asked a question. He said, oh, you said that China is going to change the world because of technology, a lot of investment. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? My father and my mother, I think the first principle is uh, you want to be a trustworthy person. I think if you're a trustworthy person, you will live a happy life. No matter how successful or not successful you are, you will be you know, basically a trustworthy kind of person. You will live your life fine. What's the biggest mistake you've made and what did you learn from it? The biggest mistake is hire the professional about the founder. I kind of feel like in China, in this kind of dynamic competitive environment, you need the founder to run the company. If the founder is not running the company, if the founder has some shortcomings, it doesn't matter. If he has that instinct, that's fine. You can hire people not above him, under him. So strengthen the founder by hiring people under him, not above him. And if you really feel this founder, oh, it's not very good because his lieutenant is not very good. Actually, it's not. You feel the lieutenant, number two guy is not very good. That typically says the founder is not capable enough. In that case, you can almost decide to just pass. Okay, Kathy, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I would feel like I deal with entrepreneur all the time. I feel like everybody deserves a chance to start your own company. Everybody deserves that chance. I remember when my husband wanted to quit his job during the internet bubble days. So we basically, so the bunch of inexperienced bankers funded the company, hired the professional guy. The company really going nowhere. And then my husband decided to jump in and become the CEO. I said, well, why don't you wait for your bonus paid? That's like one million US dollar paid. And then he said, if I get paid, the company already went bankrupt. So he decided to jump in and to save that company. And uh, I was initially said, well, this company is getting nowhere. Very small company. You quit your job at Morgan Stanley to run this small company. And the internet bubble already burst. And the song, my husband, he said to me, I want to become an entrepreneur. I, I want, he said, philosophically, I deserve the chance to try it once. And that really touched me. I feel like, yes, that's it. And I, in the hindsight, he made that decision and really changed the life of his and also our family. We made the first buckle of gold. And then I become an entrepreneur. See, <laughs> the chain effect. And then my kids most likely will become an entrepreneur. So I think the entrepreneurship, if you ask me to give advice to young people, 
Of course, if you loved the business, you have to find something you love. You love something, just try it. Become the boss of your own one day. Try become an entrepreneur. I think the best title in the whole world is the founder. <laughs> I like that title, the founder of something. Kathy, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the good questions, Kat. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators dot com, where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one, and see you next time. 